The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan, um, by Samuel Tomsick. This is part one of chapter one. So the unconscious is politics from Saussure to Marx. Structure and history. 1963 marks a considerable shift in Lacan's teaching. It is the year of the infamous excommunication from the International Psychoanalytic Association. In response, Lacan created the École Freudienne de Paris, which was meant to make an important institutional and doctrinal break with the official guardians of the Freudian legacy. The school was founded with the objective of constituting an organism. Where a labor is to be accomplished, a labor which, in the field opened up by Freud, renews its sharp razor of truth, a labor which accompanies the original praxis he introduced under the name of psychoanalysis and the task that it has in our world. A labor which, through a persistent critique, denounces the deviations and compromises that impede its progress by degrading its use. Such a foundational act does not conceal its political dimension, which consists notably in the attempt to render the subversive political, philosophical, and epistemological dimension of psychoanalysis. The deviations and compromises that traverse the history of psycho psychoanalysis concern particularly the successful combination of its practice with the free market economy, a combination that Lacan already denounced on several other occasions. According to the famous anecdote, Freud supposedly said to Jung during their visit to the United States in 1909 that Americans are not aware him and Jung were bringing them the plague. In turn, Freud and his enthusiasm remained ignorant for the fact that American capitalism already possessed an antidote against this continental disease. This antidote was nothing other than the ideology of economic liberalism. Freedom, equality, property, and private interest. This efficient ideological junction of political universalities with private egoism or human narcissism, as Freud would likely have put it, successfully neutralized the radicality of psychoanalytic insights into the nature of thinking, subjectivity, and society. The price for the psychoanalytic success story in the land of opportunities was high and led to the oblivion of the critical truth that Freud revealed in his discovery of the unconscious. The interdependency of subject, subjectivation and alienation. According to Lacan's founding act, the main task of the school was to open up the space where labor could finally become a process in which critique and truth would intertwine. The labor in question is not merely theoretical, but even more so the labor that Freud attributed to the unconscious. This form of labor comprises an inquiry into the processes that have determined the subject's mode of existence and accompany it to the point of transformation. What matters for Lacan is not a long list, but determined workers. He offers his return to Freud as an example of such labor, which may sound pretentious, but in fact contains a rejection of any attempt they would want to ground the psychoanalytic institution on transference. The latter may hold the psychoanalytic community together, but for the price of transforming it into a church, hence Lacan's reference to the excommunication of Spinoza. There is one crucial reason why transference must be removed from the foundations of the school and homologically from the party by grounding the institution on the production of positive knowledge rather than on critical truth, the sharp razor, it, di it displaces the accent from the subject of the unconscious to the subject of cognition. As we know, Lacan's institutional experiment later failed and various subsequent formations all restored the more orthodox type of institutional politics. In 1980, the school would be ultimately dissolved as it had regressed back to the transference relation.
even if Lequen had consistently rejected identification with the position of the master. Fortunately, I never said I was the Freudian school. I do not take myself for the subject of knowledge. The proof lies in the fact that I invented the subject supposed to know so that psychoanalysts would stop believing, I mean identifying with it. The school not only strived to abolish the difference between Lacan and the analytic community, but even more so between the analysts and the analysands. When analysts are no longer identified with knowledge, they are deprived of their meta position, which is always already a position of domination. In this respect, the subject supposed to know is a critical invention, which offers deeper insight into the phenomenon of transference within and without the psychoanalytic context. Transference inevitably contains a moment of fetishization through which knowledge is projected onto the other and turned into an intrinsic and positive quality. In distinctive contrast to this scenario, Lacan maintained that in relation to his audience and to the analytic community, he assumed the position of the anal analysand, where the opposite figure of knowledge and of the subject is at work, the unconscious and the subject of the signifier. Of course, transference cannot be eliminated from this relation, which is why Lacan emphasized the importance of formalization in the transmission of knowledge and truth. Only logics can successfully mediate in the opposition of two concurrent forms of transmission, the one grounded on philia, transference love, which would be the philosophical transmission, still presupposing the figure of the master, and the other grounded on the autonomy of discourse, e.g. the formal language of mathematics, which would ideally constitute a community that does not gravitate around a master figure. The separation of transmission from the speaker's position of enunciation prevents the analyst from identifying with the subject of knowledge and believing to possess some substantial knowledge of the unconscious. Transmission through formalization abolishes the idea of a dogmatic corpus that all of the members of the school should uncritically adopt. It designates a labor process in which Lacan is one among many subjects of labor, a case of the determined worker, whose aim is not to produce knowledge but to support the transfer of labor. Transmission enables, transmission enables determined workers to overcome the frames of their singular case and pass over to universality, community. A base becomes the point from which a universal can be constructed. Such a constructible universal is no pre-given abstraction that subsumes particular cases, but a singular universal. It demands labor, hence the transfer of labor, the intimate connection between labor, formalization, and transmission. We can observe more generally here the importance of what Freud already called Durkerbeiten, working through in the analytic context. After the excommunication, we can also speak of Lacan's second return to Freud. This return is marked by the change of theoretical alliances and consequently by a significant reinterpretation of previous teaching. The first return famously read, read Freud with structural linguistics and culminated in the claim that Freud's theories anticipated the Saussurian and Jacobsonian theory of language. Meton metonymy and metaphor, the two central operations in language, are discovered in the way the unconscious processes manipulate the conscious and the pre-conscious material. The two linguistic operations translate into, con into condensation and displacement, the main achievements of unconscious labor. The linguistic return to Freud became a synonym for Lacan's structural psychoanalysis, and the most condensed formula of this early development, the unconscious is structured like a language, has since turned into a common doxa. After the excommunication, Lacan progressively elaborated an alternative reading of the Freudian discovery that found its new privileged alliance in Marx's critique of political economy.
The move away from the linguistic paradigm was accomplished immediately after May 68, though these political events were not the only circumstance that contributed to the reorientation of the return to Freud. The move towards the critical paradigm was not unrelated to the limits of structuralism, notably in respect to the theorization of unconscious production and the growing weight given to the problem of jouissance in Lacan's teaching. Nevertheless, Lacan's second return to Freud did not simply deny the importance of the structuralist isolation of the signifier. With Saussure and the Prague linguistic circle, linguistics is constituted on a cut, which is the bar placed between the signifier and the signified in order to expose the difference on which the signifier is constituted in an absolute way and through which it effectively obtains its autonomy. Linguistic structuralism begins with the recognition of the autonomy of the signifier and with the minimalism of structure. Saussure starts from the bar between the signifier and the signified that enables him to isolate both constitutive components of the linguistic sign and expose the arbitrary nature of their relation. We can recall that the bar in question does not aim at the external relation between words and things, but at the internal consistency of linguistic signs. It thus designates the absence of any substantial, essential, or imminent link between the two components, which implies that the relation between the signifier, the series of sounds, and the signified, the associated mental representation, is actually a non-relation, an instable, shifting, and groundless link. Saussure thereby exposes the structuring function of the bar and conceives the autonomy of the signifier, independent from its association to the signified, and even more so from its relation to the referent, the element of external reality. The underlying thesis of this structural minimalism can also be formulated as follows. The structure is a cut, this reformulation takes into account one of the most famous Saussurian metaphors, where the process of structuration is interpreted as an intervention, which orders the undifferentiated and chaotic flux of sounds and mental images. What is crucial here is that the cut can be considered both a case of indifference and something that lies in the very foundation of differentiation. The Saussurian signifier is thus constituted in an absolute and autonomous way as a difference to another signifier, and hence as difference in itself. The signifying chain, this most general and formal representation of linguistic structure, contains a repetition of the cut, thereby forming a chain of pure differences or negativities. The revolutionary character of structural linguistics lies in the fact that it no longer theorizes language on the assumption of stable and uni univocal referentiality, be it external or internal, but rather through the cut, pointing towards a non-relation and instability between the two components of the sign. If an encounter between words and things on the one hand and between sounds and meanings on the other nevertheless takes place, it is inevitably contingent in the sense that such an encounter always contains a failure and displacement, a distortion of referentiality. To repeat, the implicit thesis of structural linguistics is that language is a non-relation rather than relation, and Lacan's accent on the autonomy of the signifier pushes this premise in the foreground. The bar between the signifier and the signified initiated an epistemological revolution in human sciences, because the structuralist paradigm disrupted the historical predominance of Aristotelianism in linguistics and in philosophy of language. Before the emergence of structuralism, language was almost exclusively conceived in reference to Aristotle's notion of organon, which enabled the definition of language as a tool and an, and an organ of communication and of social relation, an abstract an abstract convention between autonomous, rational, and conscious subjects. Through the lenses of structural linguistics, language turns out to be a far more paradoxical and complex object, a system of differences that resists totalization, and because it is untotalizable, it is both autonomous and inexistent. 
Hence the Lacanian use of the very same bar that in Saussure, um, that in Saussure separates the signifier from the signified in order to designate the inexistence of the other and the split of the subject. The psychoanalytic discovery of the unconscious stands in immediate continuity with the autonomy of the signifier. One can speak of the unconscious only under the condition that language constitutes an autonomous register serving more than mere communication and having material consequences that cannot be reduced to cognitive and neurobiological processes. The necessary predisposition for the discovery of the unconscious is thus the rejection of the linguistic Aristotelianism that nowadays lives on in the analytic philosophy of language. Chomsky's linguistics and normative theories of communication such as Habermas's. In psychoanalysis, the autonomy of the signifier obtains a different expression from the manifestations of the unconscious, which is precisely a concretization of linguistic autonomy. One cannot eliminate the presence of the body, the site of discursive production that contains two aspects, the production of subjectivity and the production of jouissance. This association of language with production renews the old philosophical problematic of causality, which led Lacan to rank the signifier among material causes, an anti-Aristotelian move within, Aristotelian, within an Aristotelian vocabulary. One crucial aspect of this structural causality was thematized already in the first return to Freud, which defined the subject of the unconscious as an inevitable effect of the signifier. But only the development of the theory of discourses in the late 1960s provided the framework for the whole nexus of problems that had preoccupied psychoanalysis since its beginnings. The issues of the autonomy of the signifier, the subject of the unconscious and jouissance. By recognizing the causality of the signifier, Lacan decisively counteracted the pragmatic tradition, which saw in language an unproblematic, immaterial and ineffective existence. For psychoanalysis, on the contrary, language is immaterial and effective in existence. Here, the main feature of psychoanalytic materialism can be detected. Language has real consequences, only as a disclosed system of negativities. Signifiers as pure differences. Concretize in, in speech, through which these negativities are inscribed in the living body. Lacan's second return to Freud will designate this disclosed structure of language with the notion of non-all, thereby proposing yet another translation of the Saussurian bar. And, as already mentioned, in the context of structural psychoanalysis, the same bar designates the alienation of the subject and the inexistence of the other. The barred subject that the signifier represents to another signifier and the barred other, the open system of differences, both explicate the significance of the autonomy of the signifier, but this is also the point where the limit of classical structuralism begins to show. Lacan's second return to Freud is not unrelated to the shift that Jacobson introduced in relation to Saussure, but extending the autonomy of the signifier to poetic language. In this way, Jacobson showed that the poetization of the signifier, linguistic equivocis, equivocis Equivocity, equivocity, I don't know, should be thought in parallel with its formalization and as an expression of its autonomy. Unlike Heidegger, for whom poetic language unveils the original sense of being, Jacobson accentuates in poetry the productive dimension of language, which needs to be situated beyond the relation between the signifier and the signified, and the relations between the signifiers. In this sense, Jacobson's poetics echoes Freud's discovery of the libidinal investment of the signifier. Inspired by Jacobson's developments, Lacan defines the signifier as an apparatus of jouissance. Although Jacobson's linguistics does not entirely support this definition, as it restricts discursive production to the equivocity of meaning. In his second return to Freud, Lacan did not produce any axiom that could match the unconscious is structured as a language, but its most fundamental point is nevertheless well encapsulated in an apparently enigmatic statement. 
the unconscious is politics. The formulation leaves no doubt that it should be read in pair with the first one. How to understand the shift from the structure of language to politics? Does Lacan simply oppose abstract structure and concrete experience? Not really. The second axiom strives to overcome the opposition of structure and politics to which their opponents had pushed the representatives of structuralism. This abolition is most unambiguously expressed in Lacan's notorious intervention after Foucault's lecture, What is an Author? In his response, Lacan firmly rejects the claims that May 68 negated structuralism, or at least his own notion of structure, which at this point significantly differed from the Saussurean system of differences. Structuralist or not, I would like to remark that the field which is unclearly marked by this move does not seem to express the negation of the subject. What is addressed is the subject's dependency, which is something completely different. And notably at the level of the return to Freud, the subject's dependency in relation to something truly elementary, what we tried to isolate with the expression, the signifier. I do not think that it is in any way legitimate to write that structures do not descend into the street. For if the May events demonstrate anything, then they demonstrate precisely the descent of structures in the street. The fact that this was written at the very site where the descent took place simply shows us something that is very often, and even most often imminent to what we call the act, namely, that is, misrecognizes itself. The idea of structures in the street shows that this key structuralist notion neither stands for an unproblematic and invariable system of differences, nor designates the transcendentalism of the symbolic order. The descent of structure to the street is marked by an imminent break, contradiction and instability, which place the autonomy of the signifier in a different light. Lacan thus suggests that the possibility of a social change should be thought on this level, because only rigorous structural analysis can explain why the revolutionary potential of the social movement, grounded on the alliance of students and workers, ended with a failure and instead contributed to the establishment of a new spirit of capitalism. The core of Lacan's polemic against the post-68 critiques of structuralism concerns the notion of the subject. Various forms of subjectivity can certainly be thought, but there is one form that the social structures build on, and that is the subject that is caused by the autonomy of the discursive relations. It is on this basis that the given order determines the thinking and action, and it is also here that the subject comes to think and act against the established regime. The subject's dependency can be exposed in the way the agents of May 68 conceived their act, namely through a misunderstanding that is best seen in the graffiti, structures do not march on the streets. The agents and the supporters of May 68 opposed structure and the event or structure and politics, and herein lay one of their key failures. Instead of thinking the events as an outburst of the structural real, they were guided by the fantasy of a pure real outside structure, thereby overlooking the fact that the demanded liberalization, for instance of education, initiated a more direct commodification of knowledge. For Lacan, the political events demonstrated the action of structure within the concrete actions of students, on the one hand, the antagonism between the determination of the subject through structural relations. On the other, the subject's resistance to the impositions of the system. In this respect, May 68 was indeed an act. This was the case not only because a political subject manifested itself, but also because it contained a minimal shift between the place where the acting subjects, the revolutionary students, saw themselves in the place of their actions and the general transformation of the capitalist system. The descent of structure to the street thus formulates an unambiguous thesis on the link between politics, structure, and the unconscious. Structural paradoxes highlighted by the logic of the signifier are directly linked to the antagonisms that traverse the established social order. And if the unconscious can be associated with politics, i.e. if political acts contain the subject of the signifier as their internal negativity, then the Freudian concept does not signify a detached and private experience. 
but on the contrary provides insight into the same structural dynamic that eventually led to the destabilization of social links. In short, political events are realizations of structural contradictions and logical formations. The unconscious as politics contains a change in the notion of structure and suggests a specific understanding of the link between psychoanalysis and politics. It insists that the discovery of the unconscious entails a transformation of politics, although not in the sense that it reduces politics to unconscious com complexes. Lacan leaves no doubt that the unconscious as politics does not mean politics is unconscious. The latter would indeed imply a psycho psychologization of politics, its reduction to the content of unconscious complexes. The is between unconscious and politics is not reflexive. It rather concerns the formal inclusion of the subject of the unconscious in the field of politics, which, notably after Marx's critique, thinks the constitution of social links through alienation and negativity. It is therefore not surprising that Lacan's second return to Freud was guided by the effort to elaborate a theory of discourses that demonstrated the logical dependence of unconscious mechanisms on the predominant social link. Consequently, the second return to Freud did not simply equate the unconscious with the structure of language, but with the structural real, the intertwining of representation and production, the two faces of the causality of the signifier. Thereby, Lacan problematizes the transcendentalism of the symbolic order that had marked his earlier teaching as well as the entirety of classical structuralism. The new materialist orientation, which emphasizes the real status of the unconscious, implies two seemingly opposite claims, that the structure of language is the condition of the unconscious and that the unconscious is not entirely reducible to the symbolic structure. Instead, it testifies to an ontological scandal that, that concerns the autonomy of the signifier as such, an autonomy that turns most real in the breakdown of structural consistency, e.g. traumatism in Freud. The more language withdraws from its relational aspect, the more its real effects become manifest. With this move, Lacan avoids the direct ontologization and substantialization of the unconscious, as well as its simple reduction to a single discurf discursive structure, in the given case, the capitalist discourse. The limits of linguistic structuralism are addressed in yet another re reformulation of Lacan's classical axiom. axiom. People make a false opposition between structure, which would be synchronic and therefore outside of history, and dialectic, which would be diachronic, sunk in in time, but this is inaccurate. Take in my book the text entitled The Rome Discourse, and you will be able to estimate the importance I ascribe to history, to the point that it appears to me coextensive with the register of the unconscious. The unconscious is history. The experienced uh, le vécu is marked by a first hi historicity. All this is written black on white in my book. Unconscious as history rejects two false oppositions between structure and dialectics and between unconscious and history. These oppositions are merely variations of a more fundamental opposition, which marked post-war continental philosophy between structure and genesis. As mentioned earlier, this opposition needs to be substituted with a specific intertwining of structure and historicity, one that does not hide its dialectical pretensions. We can understand why this opposition makes little sense for psychoanalysis. The unconscious is situated in the intersection of synchronic synchronicity and di diachronicity, which means that it constantly demonstrates transformations and instabilities on the one hand and temporary fixations on the other. In this way, the dichotomy of structure and history becomes entirely inoperative and meaningless. For Freud, every mental structure contains movement in which a psychic conflict can be isolated. Consequently, his idea of structure comes down to this imminent dynamic and not to some ahistorical constellation of rigid relations. The minimum of structural stability can be located in the processes of condensation and displacement, 
which find their linguistic equivalent in metaphor and metonymy. But to repeat again, these two operations are unthinkable without their diachronic dimension, which introduces temporality in the picture. Di diachrony, diachrony is the necessary condition which allows Freud to theorize condensation and displacement as specific achievements of unconscious labor. Freud provided probably the most passionate, although not unproblematic, vision of the intertwining of structure and history when he compared the unconscious with Rome. In Civilization and its Discontents, we read that, unlike the actual Rome, whose history is present in the form of ruins and fragments that are impossible to reconstruct, the unconscious eternal city is comparable to a hologram in which everything remains intact. All buildings are preserved in all their historic stages, and all of the city's past is constantly present. The unconscious seems to know no time, as far as the essential part of temporality is corruption, change, and forgetting, while from another perspective, it is nothing but time. History pressing on the present and manifesting in disruptions of discourse, in lapses, dreams, and jokes, in, in interruptions of the eternal present, in which Marx and Engels recognized the most elementary operation of ideology. The main ideological achievement thus lies in the rejection of temporality, in declaring the end of history, in the false eternalization of the dominating discourse. Freud was naturally aware of the limits of his metaphor, which more betrays his personal fascination with Rome than correctly determines the relation between structure and the temporality of the unconscious. There is another, more suitable discussion of the relation in early writing on screen memories. There, Freud claims that human, memory is as, that human memory is not simply an archive of unchangeable data, but a collection that is subjected to constant modifications. Far from being neutral, these changes express an irreducible conflict between heterogeneous psychic instances and their particular tendencies. What matters here is that what matters here is the conclusion that Freud draws from the way screen memories interpret other, presumably historically more accurate, memories. The falsified memory is the first that we become aware of. The raw material of memory traces out of which it was forged remains unknown to us in its original form. The recognition of this fact must diminish the distinction we have drawn between screen memories and other memories derived from our childhood. It may indeed be questioned whether we have any memories at all from our childhood. Memories relating to our childhood may be all that we possess. Our childhood memories show us our earliest years not as they were, but as they appeared at the later periods when the memories were aroused. In these periods of arousal, the childhood memories did not, as people are accustomed to say, emerge. They were formed at that time. And a number of motives with no concern for historical accuracy had a part in forming them, as well as in the selection of the memories themselves. The immediate lesson of this passage leaves no doubt history does not exist, or put differently, history is not an objective history of events, just as memory is no archive of neutral facts. Instead, Freud proposes to see it as a series of deformations, displacements, rewritings, and most importantly, conflicts, which nevertheless contain a minimum of structural relations that support the entire movement or simply are a structure in movement. History is structured as a language, and just like language, it does not exist, but nevertheless has material consequences for the subject. What Freud encountered in the representation of history is the retroactive causality, which will mark his, which will mark his subsequent conception of the historicity of the young conscious. Retroaction does more than merely modify the meaning of historical events from the viewpoint of the present. In a certain sense, this, was, this very retroactive modification constitutes the history and memory of the past. Retroactivity, retroactivity is envisaged as a form of causality and not as a distortion of objective facts. The formation of memories of early childhood, of the years in which a series of events that determine the subject's subsequent development took place, plays the main role in the retroactive constitution and transformation
of the subject's history. We can recall here the most famous example of this retroaction, the traumatic event that triggered illness in the case of the Wolfman. The event did not simply take place objectively somewhere in the patient's early childhood and repeat itself later in life. It was a real effect of retroactive structural causality, which associated a contingent occurrence or observation from the past with an anxiety dream in which the patient saw wolves sitting on the tree in front of the family house and immovably staring at him through the bedroom window. Freud's interpretation of the dream content is not crucial here. What matters is the fact that he himself openly acknowledges that it is unimportant what actual event in the past triggered the illness. The retroactive causal link already provides the sufficient formal interpretation of the event that has an equally traumatic effect to that which a concrete occurrence in reality could possibly have. Trauma is thus not a singular transcendental event which stretches into the present, but a real effect of the temporal relation through which the present retroactively alters the past, which in turn determines the present. For Freud, structure and history are inseparable, even the same, and the concept that overcomes their simple opposition is nothing other than retroactivity. In his interview for Le Figaro Liter Literaire, Lacan evokes the following crucial passage from his Rome discourse, which addresses the relation between the unconscious and history. The unconscious is the chapter of my history that is marked by blank or occupied by a lie. It is the censored chapter, but the truth can be refound. Most often it has already been written elsewhere. First, the truth is written on the subject's body as the materiality of alienation and of discursive production. The unconscious is marked by an antagonism and contradiction whose witnesses are censorship and lie. These specific features of the Freudian unconscious in comparison to others, which contain no structural conflict, but most often merely a mental archive of unclear representations and archetypes. The entire originality of the Freudian method depends on the discovery of this conflictual reality in the unconscious. For if the originality of the method derives from the means it foregoes, it is because the means that it reserves for itself suffice to constitute a domain whose limits define the relativity of its operations. Its means are those of speech, insofar as speech confers a meaning on the functions of the individual. Its domain is that of concrete discourse qua field of the subject's trans-individual reality, and its operations are those of history, insofar as history constitutes the emergence of truth in the real. Freud establishes the link between truth, history, and contradiction, thereby proposing, just as Marx and Hegel had before him, a conception of history in terms of the movement, movement of contradiction that constitutes the subject in the discrepancy with consciousness. Freud attributes to this contradiction a real status, indicating that history not only contains a difference between reality in the sense of factuality and the real, but also manifests the impossibility of their integral overlapping. The truth that emerges in the real is clearly not the relational and adequate truth of cognition, but the conflictual truth of social relations, and therefore a political truth. The evocation of truth is crucial, as the significance of Marx's critique of, for psychoanalysis will be associated with, this in, with his invention of the social symptom as a specific truth formation. It also indicates a notion of structure that is no longer Saussure's neutral system of differences without a subject.